Hey guys, how's it going? I hope everyone is doing well during this apocalypse where the most precious commodity seems to be toilet paper. I mean, what? <laughs> I really do not understand the rationality behind that, but I guess when the, the zombies do eventually come, at least you're gonna be able to keep yourselves nice and clean. Anyways, this is going to be a 13 inch long crankbait, which you probably could use as a weapon against the zombies when they do come. But my intended uh, use for this is for pike and musky, and this is going to be made from western red cedar, which is a fairly buoyant wood, which is perfect for a crankbait. Uh, this is going to be one inch thick, and I think this is going to be a pretty awesome project. So stick around and I'll show you how to make some big ass baits. So I think the days of me using a jigsaw are officially over and I've switched into being a banso user. How exciting, I know. Um, honestly this thing is so handy that I don't even know how I survived uh, without having one of these things. Um, it just makes things so much faster and so much more accurate that yeah, I'm never going back, that's for sure. I'm gonna do some final touches with my belt sander slash uh, disc sander and um, although there wasn't really that many uh, spots to take care of I just decided to do it anyways because out of habit and you know just to be that more accurate because I'm actually making a set of these. As this lure is still a block, or in a blocky state, I usually always do the eye socket, or at, at least uh, some sort of marking uh, where I need to put the eye socket. And that's exactly what I'm doing right now. As this lure is still in this uh, blocky state, I always do a center line um, sort of like as a visual reference point for myself when I start to shape the bait and also when I start putting in the hardware um, screw eyes and also uh, lead holes for the lead. Next I'm gonna start shaping the bait and I'm just going to do the upper profile and the easiest way to do that is of course using the belt sander. Now that this lure is still in this blocky state, I decided that it would be a good time to do the lip slot. And I even ended up making a uh, template to help me orient the hole, because I do plan to make more of these in the future. Now that I have the slot in place, I can actually start uh, shaping this bait even further. And I actually don't really have a plan for these ones, uh, I just go what looks good, to be perfectly honest. Um, obviously I could have uh, made a template for this one as well, but I just didn't feel like making one. And the next order of business is to drill some holes for the hardware. And I'm going to be using some pretty hardcore uh, screw eyes for this particular uh, crankbait. Just because it's honestly the easiest way to go about it. And at the time I didn't have thick enough wire to actually make a um, good and robust um, internal wire harness system. Um, but I, I did actually end up uh, getting some freakishly 
thick wire that I'm going to be using for a future project that I'm almost 100% sure that I'm going to be making at some point. Uh, not sure if it's going to be the next project or maybe the one after that, but it's definitely coming and it's going to be awesome. All right, let's start shaping this bait and make it make it come alive. So this time around, I decided to go with a oval uh, cross section. So it's either that or a V shape. Those are the, my two go tos that I end up using pretty much every single time that I make a crank bait. It's just that those two are the easiest to get balanced properly and really get a good action out of. Also, I know that I could have um, probably used a belt sander. You know, it's a little bit more efficient and faster. But, you know, there's all that dust and, you know, it's not exactly good for you. So I decided to do this um, whole process with a knife. And to be perfectly honest, I really enjoy carving with a knife. But that comes with a downside with uh, working with red cedar. As most of you who have worked with this wood know that it has these uh, patches that are a little bit more spongier and softer and some of them are harder kind of um, like with pine. So there's a downside, but there's a way to get around that. And that is to use a really thin and sharp blade, like a box cutter. Now that I have the shape uh, roughly taken care of, I can start sanding everything nice and flat and smooth. And I have to give you guys a warning at this point who want to work with red cedar. The wood dust from this wood is actually dangerous to you, so definitely wear a face mask when working with this one. You definitely don't want to have asthma later in your life. Now that the shaping is done, I can start gluing in the hardware. And by hardware, I mean these ridiculously big uh, screw eyes that I got from eBay. And for the glue, I just use a 5-minute epoxy. So next I'm going to add some weight because Western Red Cedar, as I already mentioned, is extremely buoyant and you definitely need something to counter that. So I'm just going to drill two holes, uh, maybe an inch apart from the first hook hanger. Those of you wondering how much lead I put into this uh, bait, um, that was roughly 47 um, grams, almost 50, which is, it, it sounds like a lot, but when you're working with a big bait like this, uh, it's actually not that much. Um, I'm just going to then uh, fill up the hole with um, Bondo. While I'm waiting for the Bondo to cure, I'm just going to go ahead and make the lips for these uh, baits that I've been working on this video. And the easiest way to do that is to make sure that, first of all, I get everything nice and symmetrical, so I need to make a template. And the easiest way to do that is to just fold a piece of uh, paper in half, draw the shape that you want to uh, make, cut it out, and then you have a perfectly symmetrical piece that you can work with. Now that I have the template uh, ready to go, it's very easy to just transfer that into a piece of polycarbonate sheet, cut it out with a bandsaw, and do a little bit of sanding with the um, belt sander.
while I was making these lips. The Bondo had enough time to cure and I'm just going to sand everything down now and uh, make these blanks ready to be sealed. Next I decided to glue the lips into the blanks with 5 minute epoxy. So, since I cut the lip slot straight, there's a slight chance that the lip might come loose at some point. So I need to make sure that that won't happen and the easiest way to do that is just to drill a hole through the body of the bait and the lip and then uh, just find a suitable screw and attach a screw inside so that we will have a mechanical connection here. Alright, so now it's time to do the sealing and I'm just going to use pretty much normal epoxy that you would use with um, with any kind of fishing lures that you will use a rotary system. Oh, oh, is it rotisserie? I think it's rotisserie. <laughs> um, yeah, English is not my first language, so it's kind of sometimes difficult to get these things right. But anyways, I feel like I'm rambling again. So yeah, pretty much any kind of um, epoxy that we would get from a store um, will work here, uh, even like a 30 minute epoxy. Uh, personally, I wouldn't go with 5 minute epoxy because there's uh, less time for it to actually settle and uh, uh, for you to get a really nice and beautiful finish. But yeah, pretty much any kind of uh, epoxy will work at this point. I'm personally using uh, True Coat Epoxy because there's less bubbles and you get a really beautiful finish. So the first layer has cured now and I'm just gonna go ahead and drill my eye sockets at this point. I usually tend to do this with um, woods that are much softer because they have a nasty tendency of tearing up when I go ahead and uh, drill the holes for the eye sockets. Now that the eye sockets have been drilled, I'm just gonna go ahead and add another layer of epoxy. You know, just to make sure that these baits are gonna be protected against any kind of toothy predators that might want to chew on these. So those of you who have been watching my channel for a while already know this, that from time to time I really like to challenge myself artistically. And for the longest time I was really wrecking my brain trying to figure out what I could do to make this project a little bit more special and actually difficult for myself. And then the crazy idea of painting the whole thing with a paintbrush popped into my mind. I was like, yes, I am definitely going to try that and see if I can actually do it and make it um, look realistic as well, you know, just to make it a little bit more impossible. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to do a sketch, basically. If you have any ever done any kind of painting before, this is exactly what it is. It's a, sort of like a sketch to make sure that you get everything proportionally correct. And um, I, I decided to cut this uh, stencil to help me draw all of the outlines. Uh, for the head details first. And now that I have all the guidelines done, I'm just gonna start painting. And I decided the easiest way to start would be just to paint along the out outlines with gray. Now that I have all the outlines done, I'm just going to start adding color and I'm going to start with uh, with chrome first because obviously this is going to be a bait fish uh, pattern, so they're mostly silvery, so makes sense, I guess, right? When the head details started to look uh, kind of okay-ish for me, I decided that it was time to start adding some other color. So I'm just gonna go around the eye socket and some of the other head details with brown. At this point I realized that a lot of the black was still showing through the chrome paint. Even though a lot of the instructions uh, that come with uh, painting with chrome paint uh, do say that you're supposed to have a black background first. Uh, doesn't seem to apply when you're using a paintbrush. 
But I figured that, okay, I'm just going to cover that up with the gray that I use for the outlines. And I'm just going to go over that with uh, Chrome again. And that seems to have worked. Uh, that's the good thing about painting by hand, that you can sort of like cover up your mistakes if you make any. So the head details are pretty much done and I'm fairly happy how they turned out. I'm just going to move on to making the scales. And the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to mark where the center line is going to be, or more like um, the lateral line. And I'm going to use this lateral line to actually measure out where all of the scales are supposed to be, like the, the spacing between them. And that will make the whole um, lure look a little bit more realistic. Now that I have the spacing of the scales measured out on the lateral line, I'm just going to use this little tool that I've made for making the scales uh, specifically. And I'm going to make a grid pattern to help me uh, draw on all the scales. Now that I have the grid pattern for the scales drawn onto the bait, I can actually start painting them on. And I'm just going to use the same gray that I used for the head details to paint the scales. And I gotta warn you, this uh, process takes a long time to do. So, since I'm aiming to make this a smelt, or a, kind of like an imitation of a smelt, um, if you look at any photos of them on in, on the internet, um, they have these kind of curved bars underneath their lateral line. I don't know what they really are. Are they supposed to be like undeveloped scales maybe? I have no idea. Anyways, that's what I'm doing right now. And I'm still using the same gray as a base. Next I'm going to give these scales some color and you guessed it, it's still that same chrome that I used for the head details. And like before, this process takes quite a long time to do if you want to do it accurately. And maybe it's just me, maybe my hand is too shaky to, to do this fast. But uh, yeah, it takes a long time to do this, so beware. At this point I decided that it would be the time to start doing the back color. And I decided to start with a um, lighter tone of uh, green. And I would then gradually make that more of a darker tone. And next I kind of um, fucked up. In my attempts to go a bit faster and make the whole process um, more speedier, um, I ended up brushing through all of the scales and actually losing pretty much all the details that I had on the, on the scales. What I should have done at this point, I should have gone through all of the scales individually and make the color shift more gradual that way. Oh well, uh, sometimes you need a hard lesson to learn these things. Even though I screwed up and had to go through all the scales individually with black again to highlight them, I kind of feel like this was actually a blessing in disguise because I ended up liking this look a whole lot better than what I had before. So maybe this was one of those uh, happy little accidents that Bob Ross always talks about. I'm gonna start doing the final touches to my smelt now. And at this point it had already taken me a week to get to this point, so I was fairly eager to get everything finished and over with. Um, if you look at any kind of bait fish, and especially the smelt, around their lateral line they have this kind of like a blue hue. Um, so that's exactly what I'm gonna add here. I'm just gonna add a little bit of blue on the lateral line. Like I mentioned before I started this paint job, that I wanted to challenge myself and paint the whole thing with a paintbrush. Unfortunately, even despite of my best efforts, 
Uh, I just couldn't get the transition between the belly and the flank to look good, so I decided, okay, enough of this, I'm just going to use my airbrush to take care of that. Also, when it came to painting the fins, I just decided to use my airbrush because I did some testing on a different piece and tried to draw on the, the fins by hand and to be perfectly honest they ended up looking like crap so I just decided okay I'm just going to do what I know best and just use my airbrush for this. At this point there was only one final detail that I had to include and that is of course making the lateral line holes and I'm just going to use the grey that I used previously for these ones. Before I can start clear coating this smelt I still need to add a pair of eyes and I have made a pair of eyes that will go quite beautifully with this uh, bait and I'm just going to use 5 minute epoxy to glue them in place. And after the clear coat, this is what it looks like. Uh, was it worth spending all that time making this thing, you may ask? Well, I would say absolutely. If nothing else, I've learned a ton of new techniques, new ways of doing things, and also, you know, it's really good to stretch your limits once in a while and see what you can do. And finally, there's only one thing left to do, and that is the traditional swim test. And unfortunately it's full-blown winter in Alberta right now and everything is pretty much frozen so we're just gonna have to do the swim test in the top which is, well, <laughs> considering this is such a huge bait, not the ideal way of doing this, but at least you can see something. Anyways, hope you guys uh, enjoy the video, like the video if you did, subscribe to the channel and you can also become a Patreon supporter if you want. The link is in the description box. So, see you guys in the next video.